have reached here in our journey through Mark, my favorite part of the whole gospel. Uh, we had last week, we had Jesus stilling the storm with a word. And now uh, this episode, which is probably familiar to all of you. Uh, this, is, this is one of the better known uh, stories out there from the Bible. And then and next week, uh, we look at when Jesus goes back to Israel and, and Jairus, the leader of the, of the um, synagogue whose daughter is sick, and, and um, the woman who has been hemorrhaging and just touches the, the, the um, hem of Jesus' uh, robe and is healed. Um, this is just, this is my favorite part of the whole gospel. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why, that when the gospel, when the, uh, some of you heard my sermon this morning on the radio, I know from last week, I was talking about this, that when the, when the disciples, when Jesus stilled the storm with the word, the disciples' reaction was fear, fear of Jesus, because they had seen exorcisms, they'd seen healings, but they've never seen someone control the weather with a word before. That was new to them. And, and so now they come to the other side of the lake here, um, and, and so we're going to kind of walk through this here. It says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. Right off the bat, we need to know something. This is really important. Um, the, the Gerasenes, the region of the Gerasenes is outside of Israel. These are Gentiles. They are not Jews. They are people who know nothing of Moses. They know nothing of the temple. They know nothing of, of the one true God. They are pagans. That's that we have the I get that right from the get-go that that Jesus has now left Israel and gone into the pagan country um, as as we heard from Isaiah that that the whole world is now going to hear the message and and as it said in Acts that now even the Gentiles are going to have the privilege of repenting and being forgiven that's what's going on in this text that is the central uh, thing that Mark wants us to take from this text is Jesus is taking this message outside of the safe confines of, of Israel, into Gentile lands that know nothing uh, of the background he's coming from, of the temple and Moses and Abraham and all that. They don't know anything about it. Um, so these are non-Jews. And it says that when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. Uh, this man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chains. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Um, this is my generation, I guess. I grew up watching action movies and sci-fi movies. So this is kind of the pictures I draw from, from my memory of people with superhuman strength and aliens and zombies and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's interesting, though. It says they would put him in chains and, and he would... Um, snap the chains. That's just what it means in the, the in the Greek. The original. It's just he he would snap the chains. Uh, but what what doesn't really come across is where it says he smashed the shackles. That actually that what that word refers to is um, the, the the origins of the word are a well worn path. So so what what really doesn't come across in the English is is this is more like an obsessive compulsive behavior type of thing. He's taking those shackles and rubbing them over and over and over again on a rock till they wear out and, and fall off. The, the whole point here about this guy is he is so utterly possessed by these unclean spirits that he has no control over himself. This possession is different than what Jesus has seen so far or, and what we have seen in the, the possessions in Israel are like the person in the synagogue Jesus healed that person still had control of themselves, mostly, but they had this unclean spirit in them, uh, influencing them. This is something that this man is so utterly possessed by these unclean spirits that he has no control over himself. He is uh, completely out of his mind and, and literally out of his body, controlled by the, these unclean spirits. Um, and, and this man is a living parable. We'll run across this once in a while in the Gospels. And, and if we miss that this is a living parable, we're going to miss the point of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is, is, Mark is telling us this story as a parable, though it really happened. This man represents the uh, unholiness of the land and the people that dwell there. 
These are, these are people who have, they live outside of Israel. They've never been given the opportunity till now to repent and be forgiven. So they are un, unclean. And unclean means they are uh, unfit to enter into God's presence. That's what, un, that's what they mean in the Bible when they say something is unclean. It's unfit to enter into God's presence. So he is, he is, he is a Gentile. He's, so he is unclean, cannot enter God's presence, never repented or been forgiven. Uh, he, he is possessed by these unclean spirits which prevent him from being fit to enter into God's presence. And he lives in a land that the very land is considered unclean. And the people who go there risk being contaminated and becoming unclean, meaning you'd be unfit uh, to enter into God's presence. In fact, real um, at this time, the, the, people, the Jews who took this real seriously wouldn't even go into these lands. They wouldn't even go places where Gentile lived because they thought they would become unclean. Just like we read in Acts, that, that Peter got in some hot water because he went in the house of a Gentile, a non-Jew, and Jesus said, no, I did it because the Holy Spirit told me I can, and that now it's time for the Gentiles too to receive the privilege of repentance and forgiveness. So, so this guy represents the unholiness of these people and this land where they live. Now the defilement, the defilement of the land is, is very real in the sense that the Roman army is there. This pagan army controls the land. Uh, and, and it's also a spiritual uh, unholiness, uncleanliness, because they are, um, like I said, they've not had the privilege of re repenting and being forgiven as of yet. So that's what Marcus really wants us to take from this story, from the opening here, is these are an unclean people in an unclean land, and Jesus now has left Israel and gone into this unclean land of these unclean people. Uh, taking the message outside of Israel. So day and night, this man would wander among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. He has no control over himself. These are these unclean spirits completely controlling him. This is, um, this is really, for most of us, this is outside of our realm of personal experience. <laughs> I, I know a man who has been an, uh, a missionary in Africa for over 40 years. And he would write letters to me about once a year. Up at my previous church, we helped sponsor him. And, and he would write letters to me. And he would talk about, in Africa, when they would go into a new area where the gospel had never been preached, possessed people coming up and trying to interrupt the services and coming into the churches and, and acting in this behavior. Uh, and it's like, wow, that's, that's way outside by realm of experience, but he said when they go into a new area with the gospel, these things happened all the time. Once the gospel had been preached there for a while, those things would disappear. Uh, I know of missionaries in other countries I've talked to and, and read their memoirs talk about this when they go into an area. They're going to an area for the first time and they encounter this spirit that is working against the will of God. Very violently working against the will of God. So this guy... Still some distance off, when Jesus says this distance off, he sees him. When the man is still out, when Jesus is still out of, uh, he's too far away to recognize with normal eyesight. That's really what Mark is getting at. While Jesus is too, still too far away, this man can't recognize who Jesus was. Even if he knew who Jesus was, he couldn't recognize him. But these unclean spirits, they can see Jesus. They can see the Son of God approaching them, and they know he's approaching. And, and so while Jesus is still so far away, he runs and he bows low before him. Now the word to bow low here in the Greek, it can mean to worship. But um, and that's not what it means here. It means much more what, what you would say in the Middle Ages of doing homage to someone. When, when, uh, when a lower ranking noble person would pay homage to their lord above them or their king above them, they don't have to like them. They don't have to respect them. They only have to recognize their authority. That's what these unclean spirits are recognizing the authority of Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They don't want Jesus to be there. But they cannot help but recognize his authority because he has complete authority over them. Um, and, and so, 
again, with the uncleanliness is really emphasized. When Mark talks about he wandered among the burial caves. So not only does this mean possessed by unclean spirits, he, li he is an unclean person as a Gentile pagan. He lives in an unclean land. And he hangs out with dead bodies which were unclean. What really Mark wants us to take from this is this guy could not, there's no way he could be more unclean. Nobody was ever more <laughs> unclean than this guy. He's the most unclean a person can be and still be a human being. And he's borderline for being a human being at this point even. Uh, and as I said before, unclean just simply means unfit to enter into God's presence. And the bowing down is acknowledging Jesus' authority. So with a shriek, he says, why are you interfering with me? For years, decades now at my age, this passage, this one sentence has really caused me to think. Interfering with what? Well, he's interfering with the work of this unclean spirit. The, the sense here is that for all these years, uh, Israel has kind of been a safe haven where the message of repentance and forgiveness has is, is, is been planted. But outside of that, these unclean spirits say, this is our land, this is our area, you, you, you don't come here, Jesus. You don't come here, Son of God. You're coming here and you're messing with our territory. But Jesus now has left Israel. He's gone into the territory that, that uh, in the past heard nothing of this, this message of grace and forgiveness. And, and so that Jesus is interfering with him. He's interfering with him to stop him, to prevent him from what he's doing, to mark uh, uh, this is a change really in the dynamics of the whole world here. And we're going to see how that is as, as we go on. But that's really what's happening. Uh, Jesus demanded, what's your name? He said, my name is Legion. Now, a legion was a unit in the Roman military, sort of like a battalion would be in the army. Um, but really, it also means a mob. They are a mob of unclean spirits. doesn't designate a specific number, but it's, it's just a legion would be a mob of people. Uh, and, and so they're a, a mob of unclean spirits possessing this man. Um, and they beg Jesus again and again not to send them to some distant place. That would be, in the ancient Hebrew understanding of the world, the place of the dead. They don't want to be placed, sent to the place of the dead. Because it's so hard to put it into our language, but I guess they wouldn't have people to possess then. They're unclean spirits hanging out with a bunch of dead people. That they can't, they can't do. It doesn't work for them at that point. They need live people to be after. Um, they said, "Don't send us to this distant place." Now there was this herd of pigs there. We all know this. They beg. Jesus says, "Okay, go in the pigs." The pigs rush off into the sea. What's the first question everybody asks? What do you got to kill the pigs for? What about that poor farmer? He's out 2,000 pigs. I hope he has good pig insurance because he's out 2,000 pigs. This question has been asked from the beginning. Why the pigs? Why do you have to kill the pigs? Uh, St. Jerome, one of the early church fathers, lived in the 300s. He had a really simple answer to that question. doesn't satisfy everybody, but it, satisfy, but it really tells us what's at the, the heart of why the pigs. He says, because to God, one lost sinner is worth more than 2,000 pigs. That's, that's, that's one of the really important things that Mark wants us to understand, that why, why he relates this story in such a deal. One detail. One person is more important than 2,000 pigs. I know Peter disagrees with me on that, but it's true. One person is more important than 2,000 pigs. But the parable, what's really going on here, uh, what's really going on here is this parable. Look at, we got an unclean, a man possessed by unclean spirits who's an unclean person because he's a Gentile to begin with, living in an unclean land. And then these unclean spirits are taken out of him and put into the unclean pigs because pigs are, there. Old Testament says it, pigs are unclean, you can't eat them. So the, the, these, these uh, unclean spirits go into the unclean animals and they rush into the sea and those of you who have been following this, this sermon series, you know the sea is the place where the demons live. 
That was the superstition, is down at the bottom of the sea is where the demons live. And, and, the, and the disciples are so worried about drowning, because if you drown, they're worried you might just be stuck down there at the bottom of the sea with all these demons, these unclean spirits. Unclean land, unclean people, the unclean spirits leave the person who represents all the people and represents the land. They go into the unclean animals, they rush into the sea, and they go back to where they came from, the bottom of the sea. What's going on here is Jesus is purifying the land. This man represents all the lands outside of Israel. And Jesus says, now all the lands outside of Israel will have the same standing before me. You will hear the good news. You will hear the gospel. And you will have the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. That's what's going on here. That's why Peter could enter that house of that Gentile. The cleansing has already gone on. They don't get it yet. They don't understand it yet, but the cleansing has already taken place. And, and, and so this symbolically signifies that now the gospel is leaving Israel and going into the world. Uh, th this, this is the beginnings of that. You, you remember uh, the, the Great Commission? To the ends of the earth, starting in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, right next to it, and then to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth are already prepared and ready for them because Jesus just cleansed them. Jesus got them ready. The, 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 this man being healed and having these unclean spirits out of him and them going into the pigs and going into the sea and dying, going back to where they came from, now the land is ready. So the herdsmen, they see this whole thing and, and they know this guy. Everybody knows him. They're terrified of him. He's the local crazy person that nobody wants to, to go see. And they run off and they tell everybody. And, and uh, everybody comes back and it says they saw this guy. He's sitting there dressed. He's, he's fully clothed. He's in his right mind, sitting, listening to Jesus. And they are terrified. Same thing as what happened to the disciples. They see Jesus uh, still the storm. And what it says in the Greek, they phobied with a megaphobia. They were terrified with a huge fear. Same thing. They've got, they are terrified. In, in fact, kind of at the, at the root of this Greek word phobia is, is actually you're so afraid you want to run away. Which, I mean, that's what a phobia is. You have a phobia. It's an irrational fear. You can't, you can't be around it. Uh, and whatever it is, and you got to get out of there, your body just shuts down and you panic. That's what they've got. That's why we use that word in English, that it's something is a phobia, because it makes you want to run away. Well, they, this is their home. They can't run away, so they knew the, knew the next best thing. Uh, they asked Jesus to leave. But these people don't realize it. What they don't realize in their fear, they are closer to faith than those people who listen to Jesus preach in Israel. They are closer to faith than those people who brought their sick to Jesus. Because those people who brought their sick to Jesus were motivated by, I want my loved one, my relative healed. What can you do for me, Jesus? We all know. We all know what can you do for me, Jesus, religion in America. We know all about that. Uh, my own personal phrase, you can use it, I haven't copyrighted it, is uh, we treat God as a vending machine. We put in our prayers, we push the button, and we get our prayers out. When I don't need God, vending machine's just sitting over there for when I need it. That's the way these people in Israel were. They wanted something from Jesus. These people are closer to faith because their first reaction is, here is somebody that I, I'm just not even fit to be in the presence of this person. He is everything I'm not. And being around him makes me very nervous. This is why Martin Luther, in his explanation to the Ten Commandments, the first thing we are to fear, love, and trust the Lord our God. The, the love follows from the fear. The be, it's not fear that he might beat me up like you fear a bully. It's fear because he is good when I am not. I am in need of repenting from my sins he doesn't need to repent from his sins. I need to be clean. He's the one that can cleanse me. And this is the great irony of, of, of the whole, the incarnation of Jesus coming is we are unfit to enter into God's presence and yet the Son of God comes and wants to be in our presence. 
as St. Paul says, that he was, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That from start to end, our ability uh, to enter into God's presence is a work of Christ. And that's what this passage is all about. These people, they see this on some level, they get it, and their response is, please, Jesus, go away because you are everything we are not. Now, um, now this, this guy, um, where was I here? They go, uh, as they're getting in the boat, this guy wants to go with. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to go with? He's, he's been uh, out of his mind, controlled by these unclean spirits for who knows how long, and Jesus just healed him. He's like, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. Instead, just go home. This is what Jesus says so often after he heals people. Go home. Go on with your life. You've been given a gift. Go home. Go home and tell your family and your friends and your loved ones and your neighbors and everyone else, tell them what God has done for you. This guy become, you know what? Literally, he's the first apostle. Because that's what apostle means, someone who is sent. Probably better to say missionary, because apostle comes to mean mother stuff. But he's Jesus' first missionary. And he is incredibly good at it. Here is one guy whose life was changed by Jesus, and he goes and he tells everybody he knows what Jesus did. It said he goes to the ten towns. That's the that's the area uh, of they are of what they are. That district is called the ten towns of Decapolis, and he tells everybody. So what happens? What happens uh, at the end of chapter six in Mark? Jesus goes back to this area, and the people flock to him. They flock to hear the good news. They flock to Jesus. They've had some time to kind of come to grips with, with who Jesus is and what he can do. And, and now they've gotten, the, they've gotten through that fear into the love and saying, I want to be around this guy. I'm not fit to be around him, but for some reason he wants to be, you know, it's, it's kind of like I had, I had some friends when I was in school and I would ask myself, why do they want to be a friend with me? <laughs> Why does someone that popular want to hang out with me? That's what they're thinking with Jesus. Why? I don't know why he wants to hang out with me, but he wants to hang out with me. So, let's go. In contrast, the chapter 6 opens with Jesus going back to Nazareth, his hometown. What's his reception when he goes home? Who do you think you are, Jesus? We know you. We know your father, we know your mother, we know your brothers and your sisters. You're a nobody, you're a carpenter. Who do you think you are coming here and preaching, the God, preaching God's word to us? No fear, only contempt. And, the, and that contempt, that's, that's just, it's like, just who do you think you are? And Jesus leaves without, just healed a couple of people. Goes to the, back to the garrisons, they flock. Because their first reaction is, here's someone I'm unfit to be in his presence. Yet he wants me there, so I will go. Now, here's the main point I want us to take away as a, as a congregation is, if Jesus can expel a mob of unclean spirits from a man and turn him into a successful missionary, just think what he can do with us. Just think what he can do with Word of Life. Think what we can do in this town and in this county and in this community. Uh, if he can do one man to turn an entire Roman province into a place that's excited to meet Jesus, think what he can do with us. Think how many lives can be touched. That's, that's just kind of your food for thought as we go back out into our lives. Uh, that that uh, if we get discouraged, if there's, the storms come, literally and figuratively, if these storms come, just think, if Jesus did that with one guy who was completely out of control, possessed by unclean spirits, think what he can do with us. So next week, uh, Jesus goes back. We're going to cover next week, Jesus goes back to Israel. And we have two really, really neat stories that Mark uh, weaves together to tell us about uh, the daughter of Jairus, who G Jesus heals, raises, and, and, um, and this woman who just touches the hem of Jesus' um, robe and is healed. Uh, we see such powerful, powerful uh, things happening when faith is present. Um, whoops. So there, uh, that's where we're at. So remember that. This is the cleansing of the land, getting the land ready 
for uh, the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. So let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks this day for this amazing, amazing story of, of Jesus going outside of Israel, going to these, these Gentile pagans who know nothing of, of Moses and Abraham and, the, and uh, the covenant and the temple. They don't know any of those things. And yet he comes and he brings to them healing. And Lord, we pray that, that our response to Jesus would be like theirs, that at first they understand this is someone that they're not even fit to be in his presence. But in the end, his desire to be among them draws them to him. And we pray, Lord, that we would be drawn to Jesus in the same way. And, and we pray that, that this man who went out and told the people about what God had done for him, that he would be a model for us in our lives, that we would live by this faith, live by this joy, of what Christ has done to us in restoring us to life and that that would impact this community for your sake. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.